Established in 2015, the Manhattan Project National Historical Park preserves and interprets the nationally significant historic sites, stories, and legacies associated with the top secret race to develop an atomic weapon during World War II. This massive effort during World War II mobilized scientists, engineers, technicians, laborers, and military personnel from around the country who feverishly worked to push the boundaries of science and engineering to create an atomic bomb before Nazi Germany might do the same. Only a select few of the top scientists knew the purpose of the Manhattan Project. Others toiled in isolation solely focused on their piece of the secret project. They knew they were helping the war effort, but few could have imagined they were producing materials for the world's first atomic weapons. The Manhattan Project helped to bring an end to World War II and forever obligated future generations to live in a profoundly changed and nuclear world. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Manhattan Engineer District Office in New York served as the initial headquarters for this effort, thus earning the name Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project quickly grew from its New York Manhattan District Headquarters to more than 30 top secret sites and 600,000 employees with a singular mission, develop the world's first atomic bomb before the enemy might do the same. These smaller sites supported work at the project's three primary centers of operation, where the majority of research, innovation, production, and weapons fabrication occurred. The Oak Ridge, Tennessee Reservation produced enriched uranium, and eventually served as the headquarters of the nationwide project. Thousands worked in cavernous industrial facilities to produce incremental amounts of weapons-grade uranium that would be used in the Little Boy bomb, dropped on Hiroshima, Japan, on August 6, 1945. At a massive industrial complex at Hanford, Washington, the United States engineered and built the world's first full-scale production nuclear reactor and two additional production reactors, uranium fuel fabrication facilities, and chemical separation facilities in less than a year and a half. Hanford's facilities produced the plutonium used in the first successful test of a nuclear device at Trinity site and in the Fat Man plutonium bomb dropped over Nagasaki, Japan on August 9, 1945. In Los Alamos, New Mexico, world-renowned scientists and engineers, led by J. Robert Oppenheimer, gathered in laboratories to design, develop, test, and assemble the world's first atomic weapons. The scientists used the enriched uranium produced at Oak Ridge and plutonium made at Hanford as fuel in two atomic weapons that used completely different technology in order to increase the chances of a successful outcome of the project. A mere 26 months after the start of the project, the Los Alamos team conducted the world's first successful nuclear test at the Trinity site in southern New Mexico on July 16, 1945. Although these efforts contributed to the end of World War II, the two atomic weapons dropped on Japan killed approximately 214,000 people by the end of 1945 and left a nuclear legacy humankind still struggles with today. Discovered by Glenn Seaborg and Edwin McMillan and their teams at UC Berkeley in 1940, plutonium moved from a laboratory novelty to an essential component in an atomic weapon seemingly overnight. Physicists and chemists at the Metallurgical Laboratory in Chicago worked to scale up the laboratory process as quickly as possible. And along the way, Enrico Fermi succeeded in achieving a self-sustained nuclear chain reaction using his Chicago Pile 1 reactor a critical step in being able to produce plutonium at the level needed. The new industrial scale process was implemented at Hanford. Construction at Hanford began in 1943 and was completed about a year and a half later, a phenomenal achievement. As in the ancient dream of alchemists of turning lead into gold, or as in the fairy tale Rumpelstiltskin of spinning straw into gold, the end result of the Hanford process was the transmutation of one element uranium into another, plutonium. Through careful reactor design, scientists at Hanford achieved a sustained nuclear chain reaction in which uranium-235 was continuously fissioned or split, and thereby providing a continual source of fast neutrons. 
These neutrons were slowed using graphite as a moderator. The slowed neutrons hit uranium-238 atoms. When an atom of uranium-238 absorbed a neutron, it was transmuted, or changed, into neptunium, which then transmuted once again into plutonium-239, the product of interest. Approximately 4,000 pounds of uranium are needed to produce one pound of plutonium. That is like reducing the weight of an elephant to 12,000 pounds down to the weight of a kitten at three pounds. A majority of the uranium ore used in the Manhattan Project was sourced from mines in the Belgian Congo, known today as the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and shipped to the United States. Upon arrival in the U.S., uranium ore was refined and processed into uranium billets. The billets were shipped to Hanford by rail car. Uranium billets were milled into fuel slugs and sealed in aluminum jackets. This process occurred in the fuel fabrication area at Hanford. The fuel slugs were transported via truck from the fuel fabrication area to the B reactor, the first of the three Hanford production reactors built during World War II. Why do we want to preserve the B reactor? Because of its huge historical significance. It's really a true icon in the start of the nuclear age and uh, a marvel of engineering, science, and technology that uh, was built during the height of World War II, trying to get an atomic weapon before the Germans did. Fuel slugs were loaded by hand one at a time into process tubes at the front face of the reactor. Approximately 64,000 fuel slugs, or a half a million pounds of uranium, were loaded into the reactor at one time. The fuel slugs were safe to handle at this point with minimal protective equipment. Fuel spent several weeks, up to a year in the reactor, depending on where the fuel was located in the reactor before it was sufficiently irradiated. Every four to six weeks of operation, workers pushed about 10 to 20 percent of the now highly radioactive fuel slugs out the back of the reactor and into the fuel storage basin, where they would thermally and radiologically cool off for approximately two to three months underwater. After the cooling off period, the still highly radioactive fuel slugs were loaded and transported into shielded water field casks on train cars and transported to the tea plant to chemically separate the plutonium from the uranium and other radioactive byproducts produced during irradiation. Constructed during the Manhattan Project, Tea Plant was the first chemical processing and separations plant of its kind in the world. In just a few years, chemists dramatically scaled up the plutonium separation process from a few micrograms of plutonium in a lab to an industrial facility built to separate pounds of plutonium from tons of irradiated uranium. The tremendous amount of radiation given off by the irradiated uranium fuel slugs required protecting workers with up to nine feet of concrete shielding between them and the equipment. This pushed engineers beyond the textbooks to create a chemical separations building that had never been built before. An amazing feat accomplished in about 18 months, less time than it typically takes to build a new highway bridge today. Engineering a building for safe chemical separation of plutonium required an enormous structure. Tea plant is 875 feet long, which is the length of almost three football fields. It is referred to as the canyon. Tea plant also earned the nickname Queen Mary, since it's long and narrow like the well-known ocean liner, and much of the building is located below ground. Dissolving the aluminum jacket around the fuel slugs and separating plutonium from the uranium and other radionuclides produced during irradiation requires more than a dozen steps in the chemical separation process. Workers had to manage the entire process remotely by cranes and rudimentary robotics. The remote operation was a very unique operation and it took a, an awful lot of very brilliant engineers to design how this whole thing went together. And it worked. It worked. Once the plutonium was extracted, the chemically separated uranium, unwanted radionuclides, and chemicals used to dissolve the fuel slugs became liquid waste and was put into underground waste storage tanks at Hanford. 
The work during World War II focused on refining the process for chemically separating plutonium from uranium for the war effort. Addressing the chemical waste was kicked down the road until after the war, when there would be time to focus on that problem. The separated plutonium was a viscous solution that required conversion into plutonium nitrate, a thick paste-like material, for safer shipping to Los Alamos. At Los Alamos, the plutonium nitrate was further refined to be formed into the core of an atomic weapon. The Manhattan Project involved hundreds of thousands of individuals recruited from across the nation for the massive project. Construction workers at Oak Ridge and Hanford were housed in Spartan construction camps with limited amenities. Living and working at Hanford during the Manhattan Project was not for the faint of heart. Hanford, tucked away in an isolated corner of southeastern Washington, has hot summers, cold winters, and numerous wind and sandstorms that tested the mettle of even the hardiest soul. All the workers were away from home and desperate for social engagement to distract them from the living and working conditions. Workers built a community in tandem with their efforts to build the plutonium production facilities. Dances, socializing at the bar, and sports were popular pastimes at Hanford. Coordinate Club, I think, was the name of the other one. But th those were bottle clubs. You could take a, a bottle in and, and they would serve drinks from your bottle. Or you'd buy a mixer. <laughs> that was all you could get in Washington back then. To build the industrial facilities as quickly as possible, black and white workers were aggressively recruited from across the country, with many coming from Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and other southern states. Social norms of the time, including Jim Crow laws of racial segregation, followed the workers as they migrated to the Pacific Northwest. African Americans faced discrimination at Hanford, including segregation and substandard housing and community facilities. Well, on the job of finding, there are no trouble for segregated black work with the blacks and the white work with the white. The Manhattan Project workers built enduring communities that are still thriving today. They also achieved profound innovations in science and technology that forever changed the world and created complex new problems, including the environmental consequences of the Manhattan Project. Using the same drive, dedication, human ingenuity, and political will that contributed to the success of the Manhattan Project, we too can find solutions to the complex problems we face today, including the unintended consequences and legacies of the Manhattan Project. Current and future generations of innovative minds may use what the Manhattan Project taught us to make extraordinary discoveries and build diplomatic bridges to address the profound challenges of our times.